And we're back now with our panel. Joining us this week, Susan Page, who is USA Today's Washington Bureau Chief, the New York Times White House correspondent Peter Baker, plus Bloomberg Politics Managing Editor John Heileman and Washington Post columnist Dana Milbank. Well, you heard the uh, man of the hour here in Washington, Senator Tom Cotton, this uh, 60 days in the United States Senate, and now he's at the top of every story. What, what, what did you make of this this morning, Susan? Well, he certainly didn't back off no. uh, in response to your questions, including about whether he was next going to try to uh, send a letter to the leaders of, of North Korea. You know, what's surprising to me is not that Tom Cotton would choose to write a letter like this. What's surprising to me is the most senior Republicans in the Senate, including the Senate Majority Leader, would, would sign such a letter. That is, as with the Netanyahu speech to a joint session of Congress, really the kind of steps we have not seen taken before in modern times. Peter, uh, what do you think uh, Cotton, uh, Senator Cotton's, uh, mo what, what, what was his objective here? To, to derail well, these talks? I, I think in some ways, yes. I do think he uh, feels strongly, and a lot of people in the Congress, in both parties actually, feel strongly that these talks are not leading to a deal that they feel they can support. Uh, his North Korea example as a precedent is actually a reasonable one to look at. Did that show that inspectors can do what we're asking inspectors to do this time around? What's interesting about it, though, is that is it seems to jeopardize what had been a bipartisan skepticism. There are quite a number of Democrats who had signed on to legislation intended to force President Obama to come to them, and now they're kind of upset about this. They did not sign this letter, and they're and it's, it's actually the White House actually is kind of happy. Frankly, they played out this way. Right. Now, clearly, Cotton has no regrets, but some of his fellow signatories are beginning to. We had John McCain this week blaming the weather, <laughs> uh, saying it was a snowstorm and we were rushing out of town and I didn't read the fine print. Uh, and I think they're realizing, yes, Cotton is well-intentioned in doing this, but it's backfiring. You know, and if the Ayatollah is going to give out his uh, Ayatollah's Medal of Honor this year, I think Cotton's going to be a finalist because it gives them an excuse if they pull away uh, from the agreement now and the rest of the world's going to say, oh, well, it's the Senate of the United States' fault making it more likely that uh, Iran you know, I, I, I was a little surprised. Here is a guy who is in Iraqi and Afghanistan, a veteran. He was in the military. He has an exemplary record. Uh, I just found the whole thing sort of surprising, John. Well, you see some freshman senators who arrive in town and want to get on the map pretty quickly, and that seems to have been part of, it seems you've kind of sensed that that's part of his motivation. I think fascinating this week, listening to former foreign policy people from past Bush administrations, people like Richard Haas this morning, Michael Gerson, saying um, this is a huge mistake, and partly because of the thing that Dana is related to, referring to, which is that if these talks fall apart, you want to be in a position to blame Iran for the talks falling apart. Now there is a plausible counter-narrative if the talks fall apart, that there's a dissension on the U.S. side. And secondly, if they do fall apart, you're going to want to put back together and up and ratchet up the sanctions regime. And that requires huge international cooperation, and this makes it hard so the, in the worst case scenario, that could be the biggest effect here. No, we get no deal, but it's harder then to keep pressure on Iran going forward. 